I wanted this to sound like the Sex Pistols, and in my head, I had Joy Division down as the next clash. Uh, and of course, we didn't write music like the Sex Pistols or the Clash. The most bizarre thing about the Sex Pistols gig, the first one, was that Bernard and I, I'd been reading about them in the music press, and the novelty was, was that they seemed to have to fight to survive every gig, which for a 20-year-old making his way around Salford and Manchester, I thought, oh, that seems quite interesting. You don't see Led Zeppelin doing that, or Deep Purple. This is weird, you know, And it, but it was that that attracted you. Malcolm McLaren sold me my ticket dressed all in leather. So there really was a feeling that the aliens had landed. And when you went in, there was hardly anybody there. Uh, the Sex Pistols came out and their attitude and the noise, which was horrendous. I mean, I've since heard a bootleg of it and they actually played quite well, you know. I mean, if you're going to be truthful about the Sex Pistols music, there's a lot of cover versions, uh, and it was mostly rock and roll, <laughs> weirdly. But on that night, you felt like you were party to something unique, something revolutionary. I wanted to tell the world to f*** off, just like Johnny Rotten. And Bernard and I formed a group on the spot, and we walked out as musicians. I don't think anybody would have given you uh, great odds on the uh, the bet that you two would you two are going to go on and change the world of music not once but twice. I don't think you'd have got great odds for that as you walked out of that concert, which is a bet I should have took. <laughs> I mean, the interesting thing was was that Unknown Pleasures was finished start to finish in three weekends, recorded and mixed six days, and it seemed like a lifetime. But yeah, no, it was really really good. Martin Hannett was at the top of his game. And you know, the things he had you doing were incredible, taking all the springs out of the drum kit because he said he could hear them rattling. And uh, I remember him walking past a flight case that was parked in the hall and just banging it and going, oh, God, God, that what a great, that's, a, that's the bass drum sound. And so he got Steve to bang the flight case while he mic'd it up, you know, through one track. So, yeah, I mean, it was, considering we'd had no experience whatsoever, it, it was a startling experience, you know? I mean, the thing that has to be borne in mind is, is that we'd, we'd written the songs. <laughs> Martin Hannett might have gave it that wonderful icing on the cake, but the songs had been written. And then, interestingly, literally on the fifth day before he started mixing, um, he said, you've not got enough tracks. He said, I want you to do two more tracks. And we were like, whoa. And me and Steve, uh, we went in and we actually wrote two more tracks. From Safety to Where and Colony. And yeah, we did the bass line and the drums just jamming, jammed them out. So yeah, it was, you know, it was that wild. That I mean, and that seemed wild. To actually go in with nothing, with no idea, come out with two great tracks like that, it just shows you how young and inspired and full of life we were. And the reason our faces weren't on the LPs was because we thought we were an ugly bunch of northern oiks. And why would anybody put our faces on an LP cover? You know, the music was beautiful and we were quite happy to let the sleeves join it and be beautiful. When it came to promotion time, uh, Factory Records was radical enough to not force the musicians into doing something they didn't want to do. And they said, well, if you don't want to talk about it and you don't want to do interviews and promote it, then don't do it. Boom. Brilliant. It really did work because it gave um, an air of mystery. It also let you, at 20, 21, develop a little bit before you had to uh, explain yourself to members of the press. <laughs>